Hello, 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 everyone, this evening to this stream on rewriting the Napoleon 2023 by Ridley Scott. Yesterday, I put out a video. It was essentially a video review. It was more of an angry rant um, to my response at watching Napoleon. I promise you, to those who have watched that video, I'm going to try and avoid saying absurd at all during the stream, albeit it seems to be a force of habit at that point. <laughs> Nevertheless, I feel that it isn't sufficient simply to demolish the film that we were presented with. I feel that it's only fair that I add some constructive, positive aspect to this which is to come up with my own iteration of Napoleon based off what we have. I'm assuming that some of you have already watched the film. To those of you who haven't, don't watch the film. <laughs> uh, I will be going over some details from the film, unfortunately, by way of necessity. Uh, but I wouldn't encourage any of you to actually watch this film. And you don't really need to watch the film in terms of being able to un understand this stream, because this stream is an exercise in forming a epic film biography. And that is all it is, essentially. And all of the missed opportunities in this film and the general incompetence. I mean, this stream is going to be focused on rewriting the script. It is not going to be focused on addressing the other elements of the film, but I will put it out here that nearly every aspect of the film is wrong. The acting is terrible. Joaquin Phoenix's portrayal is atrocious. The battles are terrible, something that I never thought I would say. Looking at Waterloo and looking at Austerlitz, something that really occurred to me is that the films seem so small. The battle, uh, the battle scenes so, seem so small, diminutive, pathetic and devoid of any outside context as to why they are even happening. I even remember with the Waterloo battle in particular, how the Duke of Wellington and Napoleon are giving signals to one another as if this is more of a duel than a battle. Indeed, one sniper attempts to kill Napoleon and attempts to do it at the beginning of the film. Of course, historically, that would have been impossible. And this was in reference to a cannon being placed to kill Napoleon, not a sniper. But anyway, all of these ridiculous aspects aside, um, obviously, the actual dialogue is terrible. I will never forget uh, that infamous moment where Napoleon, in frustration to the British ambassador, says, you think you're so great because you have boats. Another film that this uh, aspect of, the, of this film is a complete absence of any intelligence or indication of any underlying themes regarding um, uh, Napoleon's motivations or even anything assembling the casus belli of the revolution. All of this is absent. Another point I really need to mention, which I was really surprised by regarding the film, is the score. When looking at Kingdom of Heaven or even Gladiator, the scores are typically very emotional. They're very evocative. But in this film, the score is absolutely terrible. In fact, the only part of the music I remember is not from this film. It is taken from the main theme of Pride and Prejudice, the scenes, the early scenes between Josephine and Bonaparte. So devoid of any merit is this film that the only thing I actually remember from this film is a soundtrack pulled from a different film. But anyway, I recently did a stream over on Nathan Hood's channel attempting to rewrite the Star Wars prequels and this has sort of given me the creative urge to go off and, uh, if necessary, give alternatives or scripts for films which can do better. In the case of the prequels, however, I, I believe there was a decent film contained within the overarching themes, which I simply needed to tease out. When it comes to this film, there is virtually nothing to work with. My overall thoughts on the Ridley Scott film is that Napoleon's entire career is reduced down to the fact that he has an insatiable will to power, which is provoked by his simpery directed towards Josephine. Because Napoleon killed people, he is therefore bad. And 
isn't it funny that Napoleon killed people because he was obsessed with Josephine? There were aspects of this film where I thought there could be something, sem a semblance of a deeper sort of through line. The film starts off with the execution of Marie Antoinette and Napoleon as they're observing it. The film then goes on to re recreate the events of the uh, Pré Vendemer, which was a counter uh, effort against a royalist uprising in Paris in 1795. And it is displayed in a particular brutal and unrepentant fashion. And the impression you could possibly get very early on the film is that this is, as absurd as it is to say this, given Ridley Scott's reputation for progressivism, that this is low-key based. Oh my, oh my goodness, Napoleon is actually a royalist deep down. Sorry, uh, Ridley Scott is actually a royalist deep down. And his critique of Napoleon is that from a... Uh, royalist sort of pro bourbon perspective that that is just complete nonsense i think the only reason why the film chooses to focus on these things is the terror is awful and napoleon is awful for killing people however this film is also incompetent in being able to relay that message because as some less european centric historians are quick to point out the film does not cover the massacre at jaffa in 1799. So ironically, the portrayal of mass murder from Napoleon is directed at white people and not directed at the Turks. And I think that's a, a, a missed opportunity when it comes to for progressive signaling here. And it's aspects like this that I find particularly amusing because it means that historians of all stripes from the, uh, uh, I hate to say the sort of um, Napoleonophiles, to the sort of more, I, I like to think of myself as having a more nuanced view of Napoleon, but nevertheless, it's grounded in an aspect of verisimilitude, a pursuit of the spirit of the truth. Uh, French nationalists and leftists, everyone who has a historical background seems to despise this film, and for good reason. So when attempting to rewrite this film, I have very little to work with, but I'm going to focus on two elements here which is Napoleon's will to power, born out of frustration, personal frustration, and a desperate feeling of inferiority. In other words, the quintessential and cliched Napoleon complex. The other aspect is his relationship with Josephine. Now, there are so many ways to take those aspects of Napoleon and do them better. It's not that these, the film focuses on these aspects to the detriment of everything else, but the film does so incompetently. And the consistent impression I get from this film is that Joaquin Phoenix is never Napoleon. He is never resembling a character who can inspire a modicum of loyalty from his troops. The Napoleon of Joaquin Phoenix is a serial killer. He gives me serious Buffalo Bill vibes. He is awkward, he is frustrated, he is obnoxious, he is inarticulate. All of these aspects work to the detriment of Napoleon. And of course, there is an aspect of truth to that, but the film takes it to a comical degree. I tried to give the film the benefit of the doubt until we see the Egyptian campaign. I'm going to try and ignore the fact that Napoleon defeats the Mamluks by firing a cannon at the pyramids, but let's just ignore that. The thing that made me decisively turn against this film is when Napoleon abandons the Egyptian campaign because of Josephine's infidelities. I'll just leave it there. And my opinion of the film only goes down him from there. We're quickly shown that ridiculous scene of Napoleon falling over during the, uh, the coup of Brumaire um, and running away like some sort of idiot and then exasperated and wondering why the deputies of the Council of 500 were trying to kill him. In fact, when Napoleon was being crowned, or rather crowned himself, um, Emperor of the French, it surprised me in a way that Napoleon didn't drop the crown, expose his rear end to the Pope. It wouldn't have been out of uh, <laughs> uh, thematically sort of incongruent with the rest of the film. So on to the rewrite, starting off with this idea of uh, 
Napoleon's frustration. Oh, oh, another serious point I need to mention. It is possible to focus on one aspect of Napoleon. Indeed, I think it is necessary, given the constraints of a theatrical release, that one does focus on one particular aspect of Napoleon, or focus on one particular event or a short span of time in order to have some depth to what you're attempting to portray, as opposed to having an ocean of events with the depth of a mud puddle, as uh, contrived as that term is. Not only does this film have incredibly limited scope in terms of the introspection afforded to Napoleon, but the film also attempts to recreate the entire span of Napoleon's career from Toulon. And that, in a way, also damns the film a priori. And I also want to point out something else here to anyone who is going to attempt to uh, steal man, uh, the Ridley Scott film. The Kingdom of Heaven released a theatrical cut and then a director's cut. The director's cut had 50 minutes of additional content. Simply from a superficial point of view of liking the music in Kingdom of Heaven and liking the costumes, I appreciated some of the extra scenes. But as I explained in my review of that film, all it does is compound the omni-shambles, which is the script of that film, and the ultimate hostility directed at crusader culture and the whole ethos of medievalism in that film in favor of uh, uh, John Lennon's 60 progressivism. So to anyone who thinks that the extended version of this film, which is probably going to be about three hours and 20 minutes long, is going to save this film, this film is rotten to the core. The only thing that an extended version of this film can do is perhaps, and I hope, offer a tiny bit of context as to what on earth is going on, why Napoleon is fighting the battles he is. And I don't mean from a personal point of view, I mean explaining what the War of the Third Coalition is. The film doesn't even mention Spain. It doesn't mention the War of the Fourth Coalition. It doesn't mention the War of the Fifth Coalition. It doesn't really mention the War of the Sixth Coalition. Maybe a extended version will be able to explain what these incredibly essential elements of Napoleon's career are to an audience who doesn't know what's going on. Because I, I can't actually imagine watching this film and understanding what's going on if you're not already aware of the history. Because I am aware of the history, I was filling in the details as I was going along. But of course, I can't simply commit a self lobotomy where I can watch this film as someone who isn't aware of the history. So I can't talk about it from that perspective. Nevertheless, I would assume that people would find his career truly baffling, given the amount of truncation. So maybe, and only, the director's cut can redress some elements of that. So in terms of the restrictions I'm placing on this rewrite, as because of the limitations afforded by the actual film, the only restriction I'm placing on myself here is the time limit. A lot of people are going to say that, oh, Napoleon needs a series, and, and I believe there's a case to make of the series, but it wouldn't be fair, funnily enough, to Ridley Scott to say that you should spend 10 hours or longer in your inquiry regarding Napoleon. So I am going to attempt to limit this rewrite of the Napoleon film within a three hour and 30 minute overall running time. I think that's the only way to uh, give Ridley Scott his fair dues for attempting to provide some sort of concise narrative on Napoleon in a very small amount of time. So focusing on this idea that Napoleon's ascent is motivated by emotional frustration and a Napoleonic complex. If I'm going to take my cue from Ridley Scott, there is a way of actually drawing out a narrative of that. And I would say elevating it, in a sense, to Napoleon as being the antithesis of the Ancien Regime, and taking my cue from Ridley Scott in showing the beginning of this film the execution of Marie Antoinette. My subtitle for this film would be I Am the Revolution. So in terms of focusing on Napoleon's frustration, again, all of these elements are actually omitted from the film to focus on the Josephine aspect, 
Napoleon was not really a Frenchman. And this is why I find the claims that, oh, an American can't play Napoleon. Of course, an American can play Napoleon, especially in an English speaking film. My favorite on screen portrayal of Napoleon is actually Rod Steiger. Um, I actually find many French speaking portrayals of Napoleon to be obnoxious and comical. But I think Rod Steiger, to my mind, is the only person who encapsulated what I would say a realistic element of Napoleon. It's not perfect, but it's the closest thing I have to a uh, convincing portrayal, which is far beyond the capabilities of Joaquin Phoenix. But the actor does not need to be French. Napoleon's birth name was Napoleone Bonaparte. Napoleone means the Lion of Naples. He was essentially a Corsican of Genoese patrician stock. The only reason the Bonaparte family became French, so to speak, was due to the efforts of Carlo Bonaparte, Napoleon's father, who refashioned himself as Charles Bonaparte. He attempted to represent Corsica to the court of Versailles, and he tried to, and indeed did, ratify the status of the Bonapartes as patricians of Tuscany. And as a result of that, the Bonapartes were counted technically as royalty, but they were the lowest of the low when it came to the ancient nobility of France. And Napoleon chafed under that consideration. He was sent to the Ecole Militaire in Paris. And as a result of that career, which again was facilitated by his father's intervention in French court politics, he became a lieutenant in artillery. But due to the political situation in France at the time, his opportunities for rapid career advancement simply were not available to him, which is why the revolution is so important. But in terms of a film being able to portray that original frustration of Napoleon, you could begin by focusing on this element of Napoleon's conflicted identity. Does Napoleon's heart lie with Corsica? and by extension, Italy, or does it lie with France, his adopted country? That, in a sense, is the first major emotional struggle that Napoleon has to face, beyond this myopic obsession with Josephine that is the interest of Scott. And again, I don't believe there's any reference to that in this film. The second point to consider is Napoleon's own frustration at a lack of career advancement. After Napoleon realized he wasn't going to be rising up the ranks in the French army and would be essentially content to remain at the rank of lieutenant, he became an author. He wasn't a successful author and he contemplated suicide, which is why the opportunity of the revolution afforded him every means of advancement which had been denied him under the Ancien Regime. So an aspect you can get at in the film is the revolution as the vehicle of ambition. And if I'm trying to cut Ridley Scott any sort of aspect of, I, I would say, any sort of um, credit to his betrayal, this he gets right. Napoleon's will to power and ambition. It's botched in terms of its betrayal. But the fundamental element is there. And it's interesting that we see Napoleon introduced alongside uh, Robespierre's speech on terror and virtue, or some sort of facsimile to that effect. It should also be noted before I go on from this that I am not fixated on direct historical recreation. A lot of the, what I would say does historians, dis, uh, does his, uh, general historians a discredit when it comes to reviewing historical biopics is the assumption that they are simply going to focus on pedantic details. However, I do believe there is a place for that. There is ultimately a, uh, a very sort of thin line one needs to draw between creative invention and fidelity to the past. And so when emphasizing a rewrite of Napoleon and being able to construe of a Napoleon biopic, the word I'm going to put out is verisimilitude, the appearance or rather the sensation of truth. The spirit of truth 
should be the overall goal of creating a historical epic. And many aspects can contribute to that. If we see history as a process of reenactment, then the music, the acting, the scores, the writing, the portrayal of events, it actually all services the requirements of history itself beyond that merely of the history books. So in that sense, when writing a biopic on Napoleon, I'm going to be aspiring to this idea of verisimilitude, but I understand that one has to take events, recontextualize them, take quotes and move them around, not necessarily when they were said, in order to make a consistent narrative through line. Of course, this would be uh, impeachable if you're writing a history book, but in terms of being able to construe a biopic, which is supposed to be readily understandable and delivered in a specific amount of time, uh, such sacrifices are necessary. But the more sacrifices you make, the film suffers as a result of this. All of the things I've been mentioning regarding Napoleon's background in Corsica, Napoleon's frustration directed at his classmates in the Ecole Militaire, the failed author, all of these aspects are true, and they help the narrative that Napoleon is acting out of some sort of emotional frustration in the same way that it's incontrovertible that the revolution represents the engine of ambition as it pertains to Bonaparte. Another aspect to bring here for any Napoleon biopic here is to talk about Napoleon's own reflections on the state of Europe as it existed. And I believe there can be a compelling, arg a compelling argument to be put forward for Napoleon as the physical embodiment of the revolution, not necessarily in terms of being able to carry the doctrinaire writ of Robespierre or Jacobinism, but in the sense that he represents a existential threat to the European order as then constituted, in particular, the notion of ancien regime and the notion of divine right monarchy. All of these things, aspects that you can wed to Napoleon's own sense of inferiority, personal frustration, and using the revolution as an organ of his own ambition. All of this can be presented in a similar biopic to the one presented by Ridley Scott, whilst not actually detracting so far from the real history, which is why, again, I find this film frustrating, because all of these elements are horrifically simplified. And again, fixated on the character of Josephine. And I hate to say this word, the simpery for Josephine. All of these other things are admitted, except, like I said, for the sensation of a will to power and ambition. But all of this is construed within Napoleon's own attempt to control Josephine. You could also say he's basically acting like um, uh, Anakin in Star Wars if um, Natalie Portman, uh, Padme didn't love him, you know, and this is the same as Commodus from Gladiator, also by Ridley Scott. I will butcher the whole world only to hear that you love me. That is Napoleon in this film. When Napoleon attempts to berate Josephine after coming back from Egypt in this film and saying, tell me I'm the most important person in the world. And then, of course, ultimately, Josephine is able to turn the tables on him. Within this general sort of his hostile narrative to Napoleon, it is possible to create a genuinely compelling character here. Yet against what Scott attempted to create, one has to be aware of the limitations of the time frame. And I believe that this story revolving around Napoleon's personal frustrations, born of his early life, cannot encompass the entirety of his career. That simply is impossible for the time scale uh, of this film. So I would begin more or less focusing, as the film does, with the execution of Marie Antoinette, with very necessary flashbacks to all of these moments and his relationship with his father. There is only one moment in the film where there seems to be an indication of the ambitions of the Bonapartes, which is when Napoleon references the ambitions of our mother. That is never really expounded upon because Letizia 
if anything, she was the break on Napoleon's ambition compared to Carlo Bonaparte and his desire to become recognized as a premier statesman of France, the representative of Corsica, the attempt to integrate Corsica into the Kingdom of France. And that actually brings in another feminist argumentation against Napoleon. Napoleon is at once driven in the film by a desire to conquer Josephine, yet he is also the agent of his mother's ambitions and not his own. All of this needs to be limited and placed within the context of the actual character of Napoleon, which is informed by all of these elements. Napoleon, of course, has convinced himself of the necessity of the revolution. He has become enamored, if not inspired, by Robespierre. And it is only, you can say, by political necessity, personal aggrandizement, and Napoleon's own very acute conception of history, the Carolingian history, the Frankish history, and the Caesarian history, that causes him to create the unique Napoleonic system out of the revolution. But Napoleon in 1793 is very much of the Jacobin class. He is very much a revolutionary agitator. And this could be a brilliant way of informing his character in any film. So following on from this narrative of a desire to conquer, born out of a will to dominate, facilitated by the revolution, based on these own personal frustrations, antagonism directed at the Ancien Regime for denying him his ambitions, all of this can be followed for a sequence of events. As the film does, we can see the recreation of Très Vendemery, which is the royalist insurgency. This could be used and recontextualized as a attack against French royalism. That is not really emphasized in this film. The only credit I'm going to afford this film is that the costume department and the prop department went out of their way to give the insurgents royal military banners of France indicating the link with the insurgency in the Vendée, or rather the, uh, uh, the freedom fighters in the Vendée, and then the Chauhanerie, and the uh, directed efforts of the Comte d'Artois, who would later become Charles X of France. Napoleon demolishing the royalist insurgency in 1795, which sets his career off after too long, is, if anything, far more necessary to facilitate this portrayal of Napoleon, far more than Toulon itself. You can really omit Toulon and focus on this moment as defining his commitment to the revolution and his desire to upset the natural order of Europe. And this is followed up by his whirlwind campaign, shaping up the army of Italy and turning Italy from a failed campaign into the decisive theater of the first coalition war. Of course, one of the most egregious sins of this film is that the campaign here is entirely omitted. And the reason I believe it is entirely omitted is because the central focus on Josephine has to be about Napoleon's dereliction of duty and ambition drawn out of her infidelities despite the fact that she is also having affairs during this time. So I think there is another angle to it here, which is if you're going to show the Battle of Lodi, if you're going to show Napoleon's triumph against the Austrians, while he himself is not really in power, that is going to show that Napoleon has to have charisma. Napoleon has to have bravery. Napoleon has to embody heroism. Napoleon has to show wit in terms of being able to create a self-aggrandizing propaganda machine by controlling the flow of information through his own self-written dispatches. All of this is omitted from the film because it would contrast with this idea that ultimately all Napoleon is is an angry, frustrated, sexually repressed simp, which is what this film attempts to create. But in terms of my own through line, taking my cue from the film. Using Napoleon as directed against the Ancien Regime, the 1796 campaign within this film can be contextualized as Napoleon taking the fight to one of the old venerable powers of Europe, which is the Austrian Empire. 
And the pivotal scene, as per this campaign, would not necessarily even be the Battle of Lodi or the subsequent battles, the Siege of Mantua, et cetera, et cetera, the annexation of, or rather the disp dispossession of the Venetian Republic. No, it could be the Treaty of Campofono, because it is here that Napoleon rebukes the whole premise of the Austrian Empire and its right to exist by declaring that the Austrian Empire is an old maidservant accustomed to be raped by everyone. This would be consistent with the narrative that has been presented so far as Napoleon as the unbridled vehicle and the, the figure encapsulating the violence and the fervor of the French Revolution. And Napoleon, through his own personal fiat, determining the course of French history as a general and not as a political figure by imposing this peace and settling the war of the First Coalition. Within this whole narrative, Egypt really doesn't need to be a central focus here, other than the attempt of myth-making. Egypt ensures that Napoleon is even more enamored of French public opinion, because it shows that Napoleon is attempting to take the fight against Britain. It shows Napoleon as an exotic character. Napoleon is able to present his battles as, you can say, invoking the old ideas of the Crusades. First of all, his campaigns against the Mamluks in Egypt, his seizure of Alexandria, and then him invading Syria, culminating in the siege of Jaffa and his execution thereof. All of this can build into Napoleon's own sense of megalomania when he comes back and declares that as the Directory is on the cusp of either being betrayed to the cause of the French monarchy or betrayed to the cause of the coalition powers to aid the restoration of the monarchy, Napoleon comes in and declares that he is the foremost exponent of the revolution. I will not countenance any of these weak, corrupt heads to stand in my way when being able to fulfill my destiny, which is the embodiment of the revolution. As you can hopefully see, Napoleon is no less a monster if we're going to continue with Ridley Scott's characterization here. But Napoleon's character becomes formidable and it becomes intriguing. Combined to this, you can talk about Napoleon overcoming Josephine. What I find fascinating about Josephine and Napoleon's relationship is that it's one of power dynamics. I know that's a very leftist term in order to be able to address the issues of patriarchy or uh, talking about intersectionism or whatever, but there is a genuine kernel of truth here. Josephine was Napoleon's social superior when they met after the coup of Thermidor in 1794. Josephine was his superior because Josephine was an aristocrat. Josephine had been delivered um, from prison at that time and become a patron of France's revolutionary salons. She had made many connections and she had made very important sexual conquests, which ensured that she was at the forefront of French politics. So not only was Napoleon obsessed with Josephine, but Napoleon was also allured by the idea of Josephine's connections and the elevation of Napoleon himself to French high society and the center of politics. So when Napoleon returns, he is able to turn Josephine fundamentally into an asset, an asset which is going to facilitate his rise to power in the coup of Brumaire. Instead of turning the coup of Brumaire into a farce, you can indicate it as the one moment when Napoleon has serious doubts as to his destiny as he's thrown out of the Council of the 500. And it is his brother, Lucien, who is the one who steals the resolve of the Grenadiers to go off and fulfill the requirements of the coup. But in order to sell that idea, you then have to go on and say that Napoleon has outmaneuvered Roche de Caux and Sears, his would-be consuls, and has maneuvered himself into the position of supreme power as first consul of France. Napoleon is then assailed by royalist threats of all kinds. His military endeavours in Italy have been threatened by the restoration of Austria's position there and the defeat of France's armies and that of the sister republics in Italy. So Napoleon comes in and he prevents the expansion of the Ancien Regime powers with the Battle of Marengo. 
From that, we also have Napoleon's intervention in the mediatizations. Virtually any sort of popular account of Napoleon will avoid the mediatizations. But in terms of being able to write a film regarding Napoleon as the vehicle of the revolution, the topplers, the, the man toppling monarchies throughout all of Europe, Napoleon was an essential figure in terms of being able to redraw the dynastic map of the Holy Roman Empire following his conquests in Italy. As a result of that, Napoleon has a direct stake in removing various monarchs from power and expanding the borders of revolutionary France. So I believe a scene regarding the mediatizations here is essential. We can then go on and talk about the assassination plots against Napoleon. Here, psychologically, we can examine the idea that as Napoleon is attacked by royalist assassins, as the Comte d'Artois is sending more and more assassins to attempt to kill Napoleon, Napoleon himself becomes convinced of his personal indispensability to the French Revolution, becoming first consul, then first consul for life, and ultimately emperor of the French. And the moment where he ultimately seals his fate as emperor of the French is by committing another atrocity against the royalists, which is the capture and the murder of Louis Antoine, the Duc of Anguin. The murder of Louis Antoine is essentially Napoleon's Marie Antoinette movement, a moment. We begin with the execution of Marie Antoinette, and here Napoleon is committing his own execution of a prince of the House of France in terms of representing this Jacobin spirit and ambition of the French Revolution. So when he assumes the mantle of Emperor of the French, which is bestowed upon him by the radicals in the French legislative corps. This can be presented as Napoleon mocking the institutions and the pretensions of the dying European empires, that of Austria and that of Russia. It is a direct challenge to the authority of the Holy Roman Empire. Indeed, it is a claim on that legitimacy, whilst also embodying his Caesarian ambitions. It should be noted that Caesar is not mentioned at all in this film, or any of Napoleon's own personal heroes, either military heroes or its own political inspirations. All of this is necessary in terms of being able to understand Napoleon's elevation. In fact, the film even portrays this inaccurately. The film betrays Talleyrand as offering Napoleon the position of King of France, which, considering every Republican affectation, is completely absurd, and it would have been absurd to Napoleon as well. The whole notion of becoming Emperor of the French was to be essentially a Caesarian recreation, the summit of French neoclassicism. The idea of an emperor was a fundamentally, as according to Napoleon, a republican institution. He was creating himself as Augustus. He was emperor of the French of the French Republic. Only later did the nomenclature turn into the French Empire. So it is both a challenge to the European empires and representing the summit of his ambitions within the revolution itself. None of this is presented in the film. It is simply presented as a extension of his own desire to power. And indeed, I believe the fundamental aspect as to why they even show the coronation scene is to show that it is Napoleon who crowns himself and Napoleon who crowns Josephine. Napoleon is making himself the most important person in the world, as per the film's ridiculous dialogue, and then it is Napoleon who is bestowing that power upon Josephine and not vice versa, despite the fact that Letizia Bonaparte, rather interestingly, will not tolerate Josephine to be glorified in any way. This, to my mind, can represent the close to the film. In order to sell this idea that Napoleon is the embodiment of the revolution on horseback, he is the terror of the European monarchies. This film, the idea of Napoleon, I am the revolution as a subtitle, would culminate with the Battle of Austerlitz. And the placation after Austerlitz of the Emperor of Austria surrendering to Napoleon after the battle, coming to him personally. For Napoleon, it represents his greatest victory, but it also represents a great personal triumph and a vindication of his own claims of empire within the concept context of Europe. 
You can even say that the film ultimately resolves the fact that Napoleon brings down the Holy Roman Empire. He redraws the map of Europe to suit the needs of his own Bonaparte dynasty. He removes monarchs here and there. He creates kingdoms such as the kingdoms of Württemberg, the kingdoms of Westphalia, the kingdoms of Bavaria. Napoleon is reshaping the European order to suit the interests of the Empire of France. Given the constraints of time, I believe that that can act as a self-contained film. And the wonderful thing about that confined sort of narrative structure about a film beginning in 1793 with various flashbacks to his earlier life, which are needed, and ending in 1805-1806, is that it could be thematically consistent and it leaves the possibility open for a sequel, a sequel which will then talk about the ideas potentially of the revolution betrayed, that of Napoleon no longer becoming the expression of the revolution, but Napoleon betraying that principle by allowing the coalition powers, the Ancien Regime, to rue their revenge. Again, to, um, to, to really dumb this whole idea down, you could almost say that this is the revenge of the Sith moment for Napoleon, and the subsequent film would be the return of the Jedi when it comes to the Ancien Regime. I know that sounds stupid, but I think that's actually quite a good way of construing this in terms of the ascent of the forces of the revolution and then the return of the forces of monarchy and divine right or monarch of the right under Metternich. So based on what the film gives us, that is my first attempt at a script idea. The idea of Napoleon, I am the revolution. The second idea, and I actually have four ideas, it should be noted. And I, I do apologize if this all sounds a bit sort of like I'm making up as I go along, but this is simply what I've been thinking of since actually watching the film and having something to actually uh, compare and contrast my views of a Napoleon biopic. I had no idea what the film was going to be before I actually saw it. The second film wouldn't actually be focused on Napoleon so much as it would be a film about Josephine. And in this way, you can say that Josephine can finally get her dues rather than simply being the thought to Napoleon's simp. Because Josephine actually has an interesting political career in France and has an interesting background. She is Creole. Her husband, the Comte de Beaunet, is executed after surrendering the city of Mainz. She is then imprisoned, and it's only thanks to the fall of the Robespierre regime that she is released from prison and allows to position herself very effectively within the new system of the directory, effectively becoming the lover of the principal mover of the directory and director himself, uh, Paul Barras, who is uh, shown in this film, albeit their relationship is barely alluded to. Why I actually believe that this film does a disservice to Josephine? You could say that Scott is giving Josephine the highest honour, which is she was the woman who conquered the man who conquered the world. As completely simplistic and stupid as that sounds, but I believe Scott thinks he's intelligent for coming up with that idea. Josephine had her own political programme. And she was motivated at primarily out of a desire for self-preservation and affording political opportunities to her children. And in this, she completely excelled. There are arguments to suggest that Josephine was a bit of an idiot, and I don't really believe that's the case. If anything, again, this film does a disservice to Josephine by basically saying that she's a slut. When Napoleon is first introduced to Josephine, Josephine is essentially, I hate to say this, she's all cleavage. She's falling out of her top and Napoleon is gawking at her like a teenager. That is the original spark. And that is why the film attempts to present it not as love, but as unsated lust, which is again compounded by the idea that Josephine is actively trying to seduce Napoleon. 
Why is she trying to seduce Napoleon? She's trying to seduce Napoleon as a means of survival, as a means of forming a protection. Despite the fact that in real life, the relationship was far more skewed. The reason I believe Josephine ultimately assented to being the, her, uh, being the wife of Napoleon despite her own feelings of a personal repugnance, and this is actually recorded, she did find Napoleon rather repulsive, short, sticky, uncultured. The reason she got over that is that she realized having an unstable position where she had to essentially form political and sexual connections, which were inherently, you can say, fraught, untenable in terms of long-term prospects such as that with Paul Barat, given the fact that she knew she was aging and she was losing her looks. Having an aspiring, ambitious general who didn't see the blemishes of um, Josephine and ultimately the implications of her infertility that weren't going to be really made manifest until years um, later during the course of their marriage. Josephine was intelligent enough to understand that overcoming a sense of personal repugnance Napoleon could be that source of security. If anything, she was gambling on the prospect that Napoleon could offer careers to Eugene and Hortense, her children by the Comte de Beauharnais. And in that sense, Josephine was incredibly successful. And while Josephine and Napoleon were separated, she still indulged her affairs. Not only were there sexual gratification to be gained out of that, but there was also political use and implications from them. Especially as she basically proven that Napoleon could be relied upon to stay with her, given her infidelities, given their exposure to them. In fact, something I'm very surprised about why this scene in particular was omitted from this film, because this would actually confirm the whole simpery argument, would be Josephine regaling to her entourage, her salon, the melodramatic love letters of Napoleon, to which she just says laugh, she laughs and says, uh, uh, Napoleon is so ridiculous, or some words to that effect, I can't remember the exact quote. I'm really amazed that that whole scene made it out of the film, given the fact it actually happened historically. But Josephine ultimately understands that infidelities are to her ultimate political detriment when she realizes that the relationship between her and Napoleon has shifted towards Napoleon himself after the campaigns in Italy and after the campaigns in Egypt. It is there that Josephine is very successfully able to woo Napoleon back on side as he begins his ascent into the political stratosphere in France and Europe. When Napoleon enters into power as first consul, it is not simply a matter of Napoleon entering into the halls of power, but also the Napoleon, the Bonaparte clan. There are very prominent members of it. Lucien, despite being integral to the coup of Brumaire, is going to be sidelined due to the fact he won't go along with the Bonaparte dynastic project. But in addition to Letizia, we have Caroline, who is going to marry Napoleon's chief of cavalry, Joaquin Murat. We have Joseph, a major businessman who would later become king of Spain. We have his brother Louis and his brother Jerome. The Bonaparte family at once provides an antagonism against Josephine, yet it also provides opportunities. As it becomes clear to Josephine that Napoleon and her are not going to have children, again, this is omitted from the film. And again, I believe to the film's detriment and why I believe you shouldn't watch this film, because not only is it thematically corrupted, but it's also incompetent in the fact that all of these things are omitted from the film. And this is simply me going off my knowledge of Napoleon from memory. This is not me going away and doing years of meticulous research to create a screenplay. I mean, what's his name? David Scarper. I mean, he's no William Moynihan the writer of Kingdom of Heaven. The script is just atrocious and the historical holes are everywhere. It really is remarkable to think about it when all of these things could have actually compounded the idea of Napoleon being a quote unquote sim. But Josephine contrives her own system of dynastic succession, especially as Napoleon will then go on to be first consul to Emperor of the French. And she does so by elevating her own daughter Hortense. 
Hortense is married to Louis Napoleon. And through Louis Napoleon, uh, they have two children, one of whom is Louis Napoleon, who would later become Napoleon III, Emperor of the French, founder of the Second French Empire, a grandson of Josephine, but only a nephew of Napoleon. In that sense, you can say there are many qualities about Livia in Josephine compared to Napoleon as Augustus, in that Josephine is setting up her own Tiberius in the form of Napoleon III. Not only is she doing that, but she is also proving to Napoleon the indispensability of her own son, Eugène de Barnet. Eugène de Barnet proves to be one of Napoleon's most competent and indispensable lieutenants, first of all in Italy and then in the campaigns in Germany. In fact, I believe that in the event that Napoleon were to die, Eugène de Barnet would have been the most logical choice to become regent of the empire for whatever Bonaparte was offered. And members of the Bonaparte family, in particular de Tizia and Caroline, were very wary of Josephine due to her political manoeuvring and were keen to ostracize her politically. Indeed, Caroline's own plan in the event of Napoleon's fall was to elevate Wacky Murat to become essentially the regent of the French Empire in the event of Napoleon's death, which had to be a serious political calculation, given the fact that Napoleon was often on the front lines and subject to cannon fire, especially as the battles up until Essling and Wagram and the War of the Fifth Coalition became ever more brutal. So when it comes to the divorce of Josephine and Napoleon, you can say it represents fundamentally a political failure for Josephine, the failure of her own project to establish herself securely as Empress of the French to be Livia to Napoleon, and the definitive imbalance of the power relations between the two. And again, this has nothing to do with sex, it should be pointed out. This is everything to do with politics and her own personal motivations and her concern for her children. I don't believe Hortense is really, I mean, there is a scene with Hortense at the end, but the implications of Eugene and Hortense are entirely omitted from this film as far as I see. Which again, as this film is so Josephine centric is remarkable and again, displays total incompetence. Focusing on Josephine also allows for us to focus more on Napoleon's romantic relationships with other women. In the film, we are shown Napoleon's relationship with Eleanor Dunel. Uh, she's not named. She's just demonstrated as a pretty nubile brunette. And Napoleon here is basically shaking with fear and has to get drunk in order to do the act to prove he can have a, a child, despite the fact historically they actually got on very well, despite the political implications and being able to prove that Napoleon could father a child. And then moving on that, we of course has, have his legendary affair with the Polish aristocrat Maria Wilecka. Again, something that's not mentioned in this film and it would actually seriously complicate the idea that Napoleon is simply a simp to Josephine his entire life. The fact that Mary Louise is nothing more than a footnote, as is Napoleon's own son, which apparently was significant enough in this film to cause the separation of these two. And the fact that his relationship with Mary Wilecka and indeed all of his infidelities are completely omitted. But of course, that would get in the way of the narrative of basically portraying Napoleon as the woman who conquered the man who conquered the world. Sorry if I'm finding this frustrating. It's just, it's so obvious to someone like me where you can even support the elements of your stupid attempts at character assassination. And it also infuriates me when your attempt at character assassination is so flimsy that any one of these points will completely dismantle your film, which I believe they have conclusively. So as you could probably see, there is ample, ample sort of material to focus on a film about Josephine, not about Napoleon, a biopic of Josephine. Indeed, this actually doesn't even reference my, my brief outline here doesn't even reference 
the effect she had on Napoleon's personal decisions. I relayed earlier the idea of the Duke of Enghien. Uh, Josephine here was actually desperate to try and intervene on behalf of the Duke of Enghien. And indeed, after the war, as was actually shown in this film, but of course was completely recontextualized to make it sexual, Josephine was able to curry favor with the Tsar Alexander. And this had, again, politi potential political motivations in terms of being able to woo Tsar Alexander to the cause of her own children and less likely to the cause of Napoleon II. Napoleon's son, the King of Rome, who would later become the Duke of Reichstadt. So that, in a nutshell, would be the structure of a film about Josephine. Of course, there has to be a sexual element to it. But as you can see, Josephine's entire character is far more interesting than the sexual dynamics here. I should also note that there is a miniseries from 2002 with um, John Malkovich playing Talleyrand. And the Napoleon miniseries is primarily focused on Napoleon's personal life. Of course, you have to reference the battles. And I would actually say that the battles in that miniseries are, despite the color grading, not that far off from the quality of battles in this film. They're small, but so are the, ba um, so are the battles uh, fought in this film. And they're less preposterous. Napoleon never takes to the field and leads a cavalry charge at Waterloo in the 2002 miniseries. Uh, I wouldn't say the 2002 miniseries was amazing. I would say it's above average. I find the portrayal of Napoleon actually quite exhausting, but there we are. I think it's rather comical, but it's nuanced enough to not leave you with a single interpretation as is afforded by this, this film. Um, and it should be noted that Andrew Roberts, a historian who I do not like, a historian I believe has a very blind spot when it comes to the history of the British Empire and the history of Napoleon, is very quick to say that all Ridley Scott is attempting to do is make Napoleon into Hitler, uh, which is his argument essentially for all of the major criticism about Napoleon and his warmongering is that he's some sort of a early iteration of Hitler, despite I believe that argument actually has some weight. So this, in many ways, would stem from an association with Hitler's own rise being fueled by personal frustration and sexual frustration, which is also a plot that's been done. And in that sense, you can say Napoleon not only inherits the idea of Joaquin Phoenix's portrayal in other films such as The Joker and Commodus from Gladiator, but it also inherits this idea born out of other popular conceptions of uh, figures in history like Hitler. So as for the Napoleon miniseries, you can say it focuses on the relationship between Napoleon and Bonaparte. It's not particularly epic, it's not particularly amazing, but it does so in a far more level-handed, uh, even-handed way. But then again, I'm not really going to reference that miniseries too much because it falls out of the scope of what I've been trying to present here, which is what is feasible within the span of less than three and a half hours, as the director's cut, no doubt, will be. So that is the end of my brief summary of what a Josephine film would look like. And it particularly fascinates me, the politicking between the Bonapartes and Josephine herself and the political battles being fought between Caroline and Josephine in particular. But it should be noted again with this film, virtually none of that is there. As far as I'm concerned, Caroline isn't even in the film. And the main political intrigue is the behest of his mother, Letizia, who demonstrates to Napoleon that he can in, ha can in fact have a child. And this spurs on the whole idea of him marrying Mary Louise. There's also a bizarre element here. You may have missed it in the film. But Napoleon goes off and he attempts to suggest to the Tsar that can I marry one of your relatives? And the Tsar sort of laughs at him, even though it was a major political consideration. When the French ambassador 
suggest the same idea to the Austrians. The Austrians laugh at him, but they go along with it anyway. It should be noted that Mary Louise was the idea primarily of Metternich. Metternich launched the idea of rapprochement with France. So there was every strategic benefit to the Austrians to actually facilitate the match after the disaster of the War of the Fifth Coalition. And you can say it is in part due to Metternich's scheming to ally Austria with France. That ensures that Austria wasn't treated as harshly as Prussia was after the War of the Fourth Coalition. But anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Now I'm moving further away from the original conceptions provided by Scott, and I'm going for a complete rewrite. There are many farcical elements towards the portrayal of Napoleon in this film. Napoleon is bumbling, he's awkward, he's lecherous, he's pitiable. Napoleon falls over, he falls down the stairs and runs away when one of the members of the Council of the 500 try to draw a dagger out and the implication is he's going to try and assassinate him. He is exasperated and in front of his grenadiers he cries out that someone tried to kill him and his whole demeanor almost is that of a teenager. The same is shown through with the sex scenes where Napoleon becomes emperor and then he goes off and says you know oh I've become the emperor my love can I give you one I suppose I will let you Napoleon. It really is that dumb, this whole betrayal of this, but it gave me an idea, which is I do think there is a possibility of going a completely different route when it comes to rewriting a Napoleon film, which will be doing a dark comedy around the coup brumaire, because there are many elements that are very nihilistic and farcical about the coup brumaire. It puts on display the huge amount of self-serving, treasonous cynicism infecting the French elites in 1799. And Napoleon himself can even be portrayed as a farcical character, but given a touch of sort of gravitas, um, and you can say menace, which is not apparent in this film. And why do I think there's an element of dark comedy you can focus on the coup brumaire? Well, first comedic aspect. Napoleon comes back and he's trying to take power despite his Egyptian campaign being a military disaster, despite the fact that his navy was sunk at the Battle of the Nile, and despite the fact that he has left his army stranded. If anything, Napoleon should have been strung up for treason and desertion. But the irony is that despite this humiliation, Napoleon is so pig-headed and willful that he believes he should rule France. And this can be presented almost as a comical level of lacking self-awareness and you can say patheticness on the part of the French elite not to do anything about it. You can show scenes with Barras, say for example, conniving with Louis XVIII to try and gain this position and that position. You could betray Talleyrand as this conniving, mischievous, spider-like kingmaker going around to all the political factions and being able to latch on to a character who can make sure that he will remain in power as foreign minister. You can even look to members such as Fouché, the minister of police, who would be the minister of police under Napoleon as first consul, who is worried about being deposed as a result of his zeal during the Jacobin reign of terror. And then you have all the other members of the directory. You have all the other members. You have Sears, you have Roger de Cour, you have Joseph Bonaparte. You can have all of these characters who are walking around trying to screw each other over in the halls of power, whilst ultimately latching on to this narcissistic, megalomaniacal Corsican who has just lost an army to say that this man will be the person who will protect us from the restoration of the monarchy. I think there is a lot of comedy potential there, especially when you have a incredibly bombastic and self-important Napoleon 
going into the Council of the 500 at the behest of his brother, the president of that assembly, and saying that, you know, the god of war has predetermined that I should lead France. He delivers his grandiose speech, and there is complete awkwardness. There is no reaction to it. And then the Council of the 500 tries to throw him out. I think it's possible to have a iteration of that that is deeply comical, dark, but doesn't turn into a uh, a ridiculous farce like we saw in this film. It isn't attempting to be a comedy, it should be pointed out. The whole attempt is simply an assassination of Napoleon. And indeed, you could look at other elements which are quite farcical, such as when the grenadiers go back in and you have stories of the councillors, the members of the 500 jumping out of windows to make sure that um, uh, they won't be arrested by the grenadiers. And they keep jumping out of the windows until there's a rump, a rump of the ministry left, um, a rump of the French parliament who allows Napoleon to swear in the new constitution, the new system of the consulate. And again, I think there's wonderful comedy value in that in terms of removing just enough members of the 500 in terms of being able to pass through uh, this sweeping legislation to make Napoleon uh, master of France. And you could also add another bit of comedy that you have Roger de Coeur and you have Sears all pumped up and excited about the fact that they have now been put in a position of power. And, you know, they have ultimately duped Napoleon. You know, Napoleon is our sword. He's going to back us up. And then to completely bring them down within weeks, Napoleon turns on them, forces them out of power, and recreates the constitution with him as first consul with uh, Cambacias. I think there is enough nihilism, cynicism, and backstabbing within that whole construct of French politics, which can really elicit itself to a very dark comedic film. And the only inspiration that I've taken from Ridley Scott is the farcical elements of character assassination, but it gave me this idea. And I do sincerely believe that there is enough material within the story of the coup of Brumaire, the farcical nature of it. And I, I mean farcical in terms of um, how nearly botched it was. And all of the, the nihilism pervading throughout all of it, the self-servingness, the general motivation to survive, survive a royalist restoration and the implication that all these people are going to be executed for regicide, which is definitely the motivation of someone like Fouché. And of course, the idea that we need a man to protect all of us, pre prevent us being arrested and killed as the Austrian and Russian armies are surrounding and occupying all the states in our immediate vicinity. Right, so that's idea number three. And here we come to my own version of this biopic, which my personal draft of Napoleon. Something I think which needs to be made obvious for people who aren't familiar with Napoleon. And this is why I believe that my first draft focusing on Napoleon, I am the revolution suffers. Especially if you're going to make a big blockbuster film. Most people have only heard of Napoleon from Waterloo. You know, they may have heard of Trafalgar, something again which you know, Napoleon doesn't mention. It mentions that the British have boats and Napoleon finds that frustrating, but it doesn't mention the fact that Trafalgar happened. Um, but that wasn't fought by Napoleon. So most people have heard of Waterloo. They haven't heard of Borodino. They've heard of, probably heard of the invasion of 1812, but they haven't heard of Marengo. They haven't heard of Austerlitz. They haven't heard of Jena and Neustadt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if I'm going to offer some sort of olive branch to people who know nothing about Napoleon, maybe it is necessary to contrive a way in which Waterloo happens, but not in the asinine way that was presented in this film. And this also takes my, my inspiration from here is something that was completely omitted from this film, deliberately omitted to oversimplify and truncate the history, which is 1812 to the Treaty of Fontainebleau. The film makes it clear that nothing happened 
between the retreat from Moscow and the Treaty of Fontainebleau when Napoleon was forced to abdicate, nothing. The indication here is that his marshals are saying, you fucked up in Russia, therefore abdicate. That one moment encapsulates the completely myopic, zeroed in conception of this film. There is no broader history. There is no conception of what Europe was under Napoleon, what the political system is, what the strategic situation is. Nothing. All of this was completely omitted from the film. And this is what inspired my own beginning of a Napoleonic epic, which is to start with the Battle of Leipzig in 1813, the Battle of Nations, Napoleon's largest defeat and the biggest battle he ever fought and the biggest battle in European history up until that time. And something strangely, which a lot of people tend to overlook, especially in the Anglophone world. And how this biopic of Napoleon would start would begin with one of his uh, better quotes. A year ago, all Europe marched against us, marched with us. Today, all Europe marches against us. The film begins with Napoleon reflecting on his greatest triumph, which is that of Austerlitz, where he forced the armies of the two emperors, Emperor Francis of Austria and Emperor Alexander of Russia, into a decisive defeat and his greatest victory. But this is simply a delusion, as eight years later he is confronted with the reality, which is the Battle of Leipzig. And on the second day of the Battle of Leipzig, it is apparent that despite his earlier victory at the Battle of Dresden, that Napoleon is going to lose this battle. And the question finally arises, does Napoleon make peace? Before this, Napoleon had proposed and succeeded in gaining an armistice. And Napoleon then proposes an armistice during the Battle of Leipzig. So this is all, again, historically contingent. I'm not making any of this up. This is all bared out by the original history, which is why it's such an interesting angle to take. And the reason I want to take this is because even though I'm following this through of Waterloo, it focuses on the one aspect of Napoleon, which I believe is the most significant and the one that's almost always overlooked, which is the implications of a peace in 1813, a negotiated peace in which Napoleon could have retained power. So the prospect here begins with the film reflecting on his glory, coming back to his greatest defeat, that of Leipzig, not his final defeat, but his greatest defeat, and the idea of losing this battle and the implications there and the idea of proposing an armistice and what a potential armistice or even a general European peace would look like. Napoleon had attempted several months before to prevent Austria, his former ally, from joining the battle. But alas, Austria has joined the battle and other Napoleonic allies have defected also. Say, for example, the Swedish army is conducted by Jean Bernadotte. Jean Bernadotte, who was one of Napoleon's marshals and would later become king of Sweden. As a result of this battle, other Napoleonic allies defect also. German princes defect. Um, many of the contrived Napoleonic kingdoms, such as Westphalia, collapse. Um, the Duke of Frankfurt, I think was his name, Karl Dahlbach, uh, is removed and Eugene is desperately foisted onto the German government in an effort to save the Confederation of the Rhine from collapse. Bavaria defects. Only Saxony doesn't affect. And the reason it doesn't affect is because Saxony is itself occupied by the French army. It is in no position to defect. So Napoleon is agonizing over what to do following the almost certain defeat of Leipzig, his failure to prevent Austria joining in the conflict, which had already been started by Prussia, Britain and Russia following the campaign of 1812. And another aspect that this film can focus on, which I really want to get across, is this is fundamentally an examination of Napoleon's ultimate motivation. 
following on from attempting to do what Ridley Scott attempted to do and improving on it vastly, which was the first idea I had, which is Napoleon as I am the revolution. This is a far more gentle conception of why Napoleon chose to fight and continue to fight, even against overwhelming odds and to the detriment of France, and therefore what is his ultimate legacy in contrast to the Napoleonic myth. Because I have to say that I am not a fan of Napoleon. I do not understand why Napoleon is loved by French patriots, because I believe that Napoleon destroyed France. He left France weaker than it probably ever was comparative to other European powers in 1815. And all I can say is that the attempts of French nationalists to appeal to the nature of Napoleon is simply based on the glory of his battles, but not on his ultimate legacy, which is that of bringing France unnecessarily to terminable defeat and ultimately leaving her in the position weakened to allow for the growth and the unification of Germany, which also is helped along by the foreign policy and military incompetence of Napoleon III. But all of these questions are proposed by this film because it focuses on the question of making peace during the Battle of Leipzig and the failed negotiations regarding an armistice. But there is another aspect to this, which is Napoleon and the prospect of responsibility for the dead. A really childish thing that the film does at the end, the Ridley Scott film, is it lists the number of dead in Napoleon's campaigns. That again confirms to me that, oh, it's Napoleon bad because death, because this film is stupid. But a far more interesting and intelligent question to ask, yes, these men died, but does Napoleon bear ultimate responsibility? And this is phrased not by an omniscient narrator, but by Napoleon himself asking that question and attempting to justify those deaths and his own legacy. And this reflects on his relationship with his underlings. As it reflects on the Battle of Leipzig in particular, we go to Ney, we go to Murat, we go to Bernadotte. Um, someone can help me in the chat, I'm forgetting. The Prince of Poland, who led and died at Leipzig, who leading the uh, the Polish contingent and the cavalry. Someone in the chat will be able to tell me, uh, tell me, and uh, I'll be able to po point his name up. Uh, not Poniatowski, uh, Pontevesky, but someone in the chat will know. So uh, do bear with me there. The question here, and Bertier and Eugene. <coughs> the question here. <coughs> Poniatowski. Fantastic, thank you. The question here is to what extent does Napoleon earn his own defeat? Or to what extent it can be blamed on his underlings? And this is a huge flaw in this Ridley Scott film, because Napoleon, you would give the impression that Napoleon has no marshals. Napoleon's relationship with his marshals is one of the most oft commented things, and Napoleon's and marshals in their own right have been immortalized. But I don't believe we have really the name of any marshals in this film. Indeed, what is so stupid about the portrayal of the Battle of Waterloo is that Napoleon is nay. Napoleon is the one with the death wish. Napoleon is the one leading the charge, despite the fact, I know this is going to sound extraordinary, that Napoleon was basically incapacitated during the battle. <laughs> I mean, you know, the absurdity of this film just continues, but Napoleon is nay uh, in, the, in, Welling, in, in um, Waterloo in the Ridley Scott film. But there's a really interesting angle to consider, which is the idea of his relationship with Ney, Murat, Bernadotte, Bertier, and Eugene specifically, and by extension, the rest of his marshals. So we come here from the question of the Battle of Leipzig and the final prospect of the demise of the Napoleonic Empire in Europe. And Napoleon has to think of contingency options here. Germany is lost, but by some miracle, 
we have the Frankfurt Peace Proposals, which are offered by Metternich. Again, understand that Metternich is intelligent enough to see the future conflict with Russia, i.e. that between Prussia, Austria, and Russia, and that will dominate the Congress of Vienna. And so Metternich understands that having Napoleon in power would ultimately serve the interests of Austria. However, Napoleon needed to be sufficiently reduced in power in order for that to be a tenable position. And he had to embrace this idea of being an Austrian ally. To put this in perspective, this is the principal reason why, in addition to everything else, positioning this essentially as a royalist, I despise Napoleon from the point of view of being sympathetic to French nationalism. Napoleon rejects the Frankfurt peace proposals. The Frankfurt peace proposals, which would have allowed France significantly expanded borders, reflecting that of the Peace of Amiens in 1802, which would have included Nice, Savoy, Belgium, and the left bank of the Rhine. I don't need to explain to people here how had France been able to retain those territories, the entire history of Europe and German unification would have been different, and France would have been able to predominate in European affairs thereafter to this day. Which is why I find this the most interesting question to ask, is why did Napoleon reject the Frankfurt peace proposals? Why instead did he pursue for an armistice, which he knew, surely he must have known, would have been rejected because he had already proposed an armistice before, which led to further renewed hostilities. In other words, European leaders were not going to countenance anything other than a lasting peace rather than a temporary truce, which is what Napoleon wanted, because they knew all Napoleon would do was go back, reorganize his forces and attempt to fight on. This to me is the most interesting aspect of Napoleon and is something which is barely ever mentioned. How I would sort of show it in my film here is that Napoleon would then reflect back on an earlier meeting with Metternich in June of 1813. The Frankfurt Peace Proposals were in November 1813, by the way. And Napo this is actually a scene in the Napoleon miniseries of 2002, where Napoleon will reflect on the fact that Metternich gave him an ultimatum, which basically had the same effects of the Frankfurt Proposals. And Napoleon treats this as a personal betrayal because Austria was his ally. He had married into the House of Austria by marrying Mary Louise, and the King of Rome was the grandson of the Emperor of Austria, the Emperor Francis. This feeds into my idea of why it is important to focus on the relationship with Napoleon's marshals and relatives, because it also informs his relationship with foreign powers, such as that with Alexander. Napoleon is so vainglorious, and he's so domineering, that he cannot possibly view events and motivations of other people acting in their own self-interests. He always has to view it through the, through the lens of betrayal. And this would be my measure of interest as to what extent Napoleon brought about his own demise. He could not adequately appraise the strategic situation France found itself in 1813 because he was dominated, or rather he was a slave to his own desire to will to power. And by extent, he himself had no flaws. It was instead the betrayal of his own underlings and the betrayal of foreign powers. As childish as that sounds, I do believe that's a really interesting angle with Napoleon to cover, and far more interesting than Napoleon's relationship or the stupid reduced relationship he has with Josephine in the Ridley Scott film. In terms of being able to understand this through Napoleon's own thought process, we intersplice this with him in exile at St. Helena, because this allows the film to reflect back on earlier moments within Napoleon's career. So given the situation with Austria, Napoleon can reflect on what Austria here means to him and the grand conception of his empire building. So from St. Helena, Napoleon is replaying his old battles in his head every day. He goes back to Lodi. He goes back to Marengo, the original campaigns in Italy. And the implication here is, is Napoleon driven primarily to expand the revolution at the point of the sword, which is the theme I try to expound in the idea of Napoleon, I am the revolution, 
and by extension to banish the remnants of the archaic feudal order of Europe and establish a new Carolingian dynasty under the Bonapartes. Was his interest to serve the best, was his ultimate desire to serve the best interests of France? Or were his ultimate designs set on immortality, stemming from vainglory and a pathological need to uproot Europe to impose his dominion upon the ancient regimes? In other words, were his interests ideological? Were his interests nationalistic? Or were they personal? And this focuses on the idea of why Napoleon rejects the Frankfurt peace proposals, Napoleon's own justification to continue fighting. Because after this, he rejects these proposals in November. He is set on total victory. And it is here that Napoleon shows his last real glimmer of military brilliance, which is the Six Days Campaign in February of 1814. But to any sound military strategist, this strategy was suicide. France was being invaded in all fronts for the first time, really, since the beginning of the wars of the revolution. France had been invaded. Napoleon had failed to adequately prepare the defences along the Rhine, despite France having expanded to its natural boundaries. And so Napoleon has surrendered France and now he is facilitating the invasion of France, all the while training recruits on the march, conscripting more and more men all at the same time. So Napoleon's first question over whether to settle and ultimately serve the interests of France are abandoned in terms of serving his idea to dominate. We then come back to the idea of Napoleon's conception of personal betrayal. Because after Leipzig, Murat, one of his best generals, a marshal, and his brother-in-law through Caroline, defects. And we have the forced abdication of Fontainebleau. Napoleon is embittered at this because he sees this as an element of betrayal. Napoleon cannot conceive of the idea of military defeat. Instead, he looks at the marshals and declares that, I have created you, and now you are desperate to surrender me to save the titles, the titles that I gave you. Very similar to the scene in Waterloo in 1870. However, this idea of Napoleon's own sense of abject betrayal and the fact that he is not responsible for this defeat, it is instead the fault of others, goes back to Austria. Because as a result of his former allies Austria's intervention, he has now been separated from his son, and his wife, Mary Louise. And it is an exile that Napoleon can reflect on his coronation and his conception of his eternal possession of France. For abdication or no abdication, he has become the embodiment of France. In other words, the marshals cannot remove him, the people cannot remove him, the coalition cannot remove him, because he found the, gutter, found the, throne, uh, the crown of France in the gutter, picked it up with his sword, and became France. He became the embodiment of France. And as a result of that, no one can remove him. He is entitled to the allegiance of France in perpetuity. Another interesting aspect regarding his St. Helena recreations of his battles, returning always to his pitiable exile in St. Helena, is the idea of Napoleon's own, you can say, a conception of his marshal's triumphs, not just their betrayals and weaknesses. I always look to Moreau at Hohenlinden and Davout at Oerstedt and see that Napoleon was in part also driven by a genuine sensation of jealousy. Jealousy towards his own commanders, which given Napoleon's own military prowess seems narcissistic and petty in the extreme, but it exists. Marengo nearly turned into a disaster in the War of the Second Coalition. The decisive battle was not Napoleon's, it was Moreau's at the Battle of Hohenlinden. As a result of this, Napoleon forced Moreau essentially into becoming the unofficial head of the opposition, and ultimately he was forced into exile. With Davout, Davout won the Battle of Oerstedt. The Battle of Oerstedt was a brilliant victory, far more brilliant than Napoleon's victory at Jena. 
Napoleon wasn't even fighting the main detachment of the Prussians. Davout was at Oerstedt. He was fighting the main Prussian army and the larger army with half as many men as Napoleon had. And yet he still won. And how does Napoleon betray, uh, how does Napoleon uh, treat Davout? By amalgamating the victories of Jena and Oerstedt. So the conception here, based on his reflections about his coronation, and Napoleon coming into the possession of France as his own personal entity, and that France owes him allegiance, is therefore the idea that all of the victories accrued by France are owed to him, and him alone. And by extension, all of the defeats of Napoleon are the result of foreign subversion and generalized incompetence of his underlings. What I find so fascinating about this betrayal of Napoleon is that he is adopting all the elements of divine right kingship, albeit it is kingship bestowed on him by right of the revolution. And by extension here, in terms of his recontextualization and bastardization of kingship, he is taking the possession part seriously. Uh, he cannot abdicate for he has ascended to the stratosphere. He is Caesar. He is a king. In the same way that we have, say, for example, Mary, Queen of Scots, standing before her judges in uh, uh, Fotheringay and saying that you have no right to judge me for I am a queen. I am not equal to you. I am a prince, a prince bestowed upon that position by Christ and therefore a vice regent, abdication or no abdication. Napoleon takes this concept and he subverts it by saying he is entitled to the victories of France, but not to the responsibility of defeat. I recently did a stream on Robert E. Lee and a complete juxtaposition here between him and Robert E. Lee is that Robert E. Lee had to manage his underlings, such as General Longstreet and uh, General Hill and General Ewell. And despite you can say the deficiencies of his underlings in some regards, Ely ultimately took personal responsibility, despite not actually being in charge of Virginia or the Confederacy. But here, Napoleon is France. Napoleon therefore has the greatest responsibility for the maintenance of France, but Napoleon refuses to take responsibility for his actions. And psychologically, I think that is a fundamental point in understanding one of the reasons why he decided to reject the peace proposals at Fontainebleau. And this also goes for his titles. All of the titles that he had been bestowed on his marshals had come from Napoleon. All of the kings that Napoleon had created from Joseph to Jerome to Louis had been created by him. And so when Napoleon sees that his brother Louis over the Batavian Republic and later the Kingdom of the Netherlands is being preferential to the interests of the Dutch, I know, shock horror, over the French, what does Napoleon do? Napoleon removes his brother and annexes the Netherlands to France. In other words, all of these titles were nothing more than the extensions of Napoleonic fiat. They were expected to follow Napoleon as an absolute dictator and should they not only possibly show the indication of showing interest towards the local considerations like in Holland, but should they act against him in any way or even be shown to be less than competent than he hoped, they will be removed and they will be replaced. Nothing is sacred from Napoleon in terms of this conception. And that is the fundamental sort of idea I really want to get across in this idea of Napoleon, all of Europe against us from Leipzig to Waterloo. And here we come to exile in Elba. It is here that Napoleon hears of the death of Josephine. And you can say that the only real significance here for Josephine is Napoleon is compounding the idea that he has very little to lose when he returns in the Hundred Days. Despite being dispossessed of France, he still maintains the fact that France belongs to him. Political ambition combined with personal desperation, as you can say, the inverse of the Frankfurt proposals. But then again, it's the motivation to settle in peace, settle in his exile as Emperor of Elba, or to continue to fight against hopeless odds. And with the Frankfurt proposals after Leipzig, and with the situation in Elba, Napoleon resolves each time to fight, and to fight against impossible odds, where there was no chance of victory almost to the point that Napoleon really should have died in any of these conflicts, and that's another point to consider also.
the contrast between Napoleon leaving his exile in Elba and Napoleon rejecting the Frankfurt proposals. In other words, I do believe that contained within the space of two years, albeit were reflections after at St. Helena and before, that you can create incredibly compelling psychological and thematic narrative regarding Napoleon without having to do the entire span of history as Ridley Scott had done. Because if anything, Ridley Scott has demonstrated that it's idiotic to attempt to cover the entire chronology in a single film, whereas I believe it's manageable within three and a half hours to focus on these elements between Leipzig and Waterloo. So here, it comes to the 100 days. And Napoleon, once again, is confronted with this idea of the loyalty and effectiveness of his underlings, and to what extent they can deliver him the victory that he believes he is owed. Ney, for example, famously says that I will bring Napoleon back in an iron cage to the new king of France, Louis XVIII. But ultimately, it is Ney is the first major figure to defect. Murat, after losing the Kingdom of Naples a few months later, returns to France after the Battle of Tolentino. But in this case, Napoleon has forgiven Ney, but he ultimately spurns Murat. He will not listen to him. He will not him help him restore his Kingdom of Naples. So again, you can see here that Napoleon is still embittered. He is looking back to the legacy of Fontainebleau. He is looking back to these ideas of personal betrayal, and he is renouncing his ties with figures who he believed that have acted against his interests, and by extension, the interests of the empire. And this theme extends beyond Murat. It extends to Berthier, who did not join Napoleon and thereby denied Napoleon the services of the great chief of staff of the armed forces of the Grande Armée who have been indispensable to the victories and fought alongside Napoleon in Germany and in 1814. But in 1815, Berthier himself has refused to ally with Napoleon. Eugène de Beauharnais, the man who was instrumental in terms of the administration in Italy as viceroy and later the prince primate of Germany for a brief time in an attempt to desperately arrest the decline of the Napoleonic empire there, also refuses to abandon his promise to the coalition powers and to join with Napoleon. In other words, in Napoleon's mind, this is all compounding the fact that his relatives, and again, figures such as Joseph Bonaparte also have an interesting relationship when it goes to the Hundred Days, but you know, there's so much detail here that you can draw in, and there's only so much you can focus in within the confined space of uh, three and a half hours. So we're talking about this idea of Napoleon's own desire for immortality, Napoleon's belief in the allegiance of France. Napoleon, by happenstance, has also gained possession of a much larger army than he had in 1814. And it comes here to the third act of the film, which is Waterloo. And here, Napoleon is quick to denounce Ney for failing to follow up the pursuit of the Prussians after the Battle of Ligny which ultimately allows them to regroup. And then we also see Napoleon chiding the legacy of Grouchy for pursuing the Prussians, but failing to link up with France during the Battle of Wellington, allowing the Prussians to rejoin and get in between Grouchy and Napoleon. Rather than ending at Waterloo, however, because again, this is talking about Napoleon's own sense of power and his ownership of France, we need to focus on what actually happened after Waterloo, which again, the, the film presents a fiction, a fiction of a uh, of an immediate surrender after Waterloo to the British, but it's far worse than that. And again, if you're trying to assassinate a character, Ridley Scott, there are opportunities for you, which means it could be more thorough, but you haven't taken those opportunities because you're incompetent at that even. He returns to Paris, the Austrians are now invading. The Prussians are invading. The British are invading. The cream of the French army has been defeated. There is nothing left. But Napoleon goes back and he attempts to raise a new army as he did in 1814. And it's at this moment that we can see another scene of introspection back in St. Helena, where after Waterloo, and Napoleon has dealt with the idea of losing his army, the Grand Army, over and over again. And by reflecting on manpower 
relating to the causes of his defeats. Napoleon can look back at Spain, the men he committed there and ultimately the men wasted there. And his, you can say the one of the supreme examples of Napoleon's hubris in terms of his unnecessary annexation of Spain to the Bonapartist enterprise. But consequently, the manpower shortages led to Napoleon's decisive defeat at the Battle of Essling, which could have turned into a disaster had he not been able to reverse that defeat at the Battle of Wagram. That also then follows into the idea of the implications of the invasion of Russia. And it is here, at the end of the film, after the Battle of Waterloo, that Napoleon begins to seriously consider the implications of Russia. And he draws the conclusion that the failure of Leipzig, again, was also related to the, this idea of having to regroup and organize the army and really carry off a miracle in terms of logistics and recruitment to assemble a new army despite the material and manpower shortages following the disaster of 1812. However, Napoleon takes all of this and he draws the wrong conclusion. He doesn't look at this and say, for all of my faults, my desire, my aim was always more men, more men. I will create new armies, new campaigns, new resources, and I will continue fighting as if he had a limitless pool of manpower and resources, and he never showed any consideration for the implications of throwing away all of those lives. And rather than Napoleon taking responsibility for that and seeing the effects of these three major defeats of Essling, of Leipzig and of Waterloo. Napoleon instead reflects that I should have died in Moscow. Should I have died in Moscow, I would be renowned as the greatest of Europe's conquerors. But again, what that statement does is betray Napoleon's ultimate lack of interest in both the revolution and France and the fate of his army of which he is directly responsible. Because Napoleon isn't interested in the fallout of his consequence of invading Russia after, after Borodino and taking Moscow. He is instead interested in the fact that he has taken Moscow, the fact that he has defeated the Prussians, he has conquered Spain ostensibly, he has defeated the Austrians, he will have defeated the British had it not been for traitors within Europe, those contriving against his continental system, the perfidious Alexander of Russia. Had I died here, I would have been immortalized as a conqueror. But as you can probably see from that statement, which is a real statement, everything else, his dynasty and the legacy he would bequeath to his son and the welfare of France and its people are superfluous to him, to Napoleon's star. And Napoleon's star is all pervasive. And Napoleon would do anything to recapture that star, which is why it's here that Napoleon reflects not on whether I should take responsibility, but where I should have died in order to ensure my own immortality. And it is in Moscow. So Napoleon's lack of atonement and his will to power at the expense of all other things is the recurring theme. Napoleon is then deposed by the French assembly. Louis XVIII come back, comes back and he himself surrenders to the British. And again, in a note of complete sort of delusion and separation from reality, and this is actually presented in the film, albeit contrived ahistorically, Napoleon believes he's going to be settled in a country estate in England, despite the fact that politically that was impossible. Even if that had been possible, it would have been ridiculous to position Napoleon so close to France where he would have remained a political consideration. The British public would never have accepted it. And the rest of the coalition powers were demanding Napoleon's head. Yet Napoleon genuinely believed that he could be treated essentially as a venerable and revered exile and choose and make essentially an, a decision for his own terms of exile, despite the complete horror show after Waterloo. And so what does Napoleon do after the British decide to send him to St. Helena? Napoleon admonishes the British for their betrayal, 
he surrendered to the British in good faith, but the British did not give him the conditions for the exile he wanted. And then we look into the broader implications of the loyalty of his men and the just deserts. Because as a result of the Hundred Days, tens of thousands of French had died unnecessarily. Bertier has been defenestrated. There's a theory that, Napo uh, that Bertier was possibly assassinated, thrown out of a window in order to prevent him possibly joining with Napoleon, which he never did, as I demonstrated. But this was in, I believe, June of 1815. But that would have been an interesting angle that Bertier ultimately owes his death to Napoleon. We have the execution of Murat, and we have the execution of Ney. Ney, who was prepared to die for defending France in the same way that Ney had a death wish on the Battle of Waterloo. But Ney had been able to survive after Napoleon's first abdication. But here, Ney has been executed for his desire to rejoin and serve Napoleon in 100 days, again, a consequence of Napoleon's hubris. This again is going into alternative history, so I don't really want to lean too much on this because what I presented here is basically factual. But I have always posited the idea of Napoleon returning from Elba, not for his own power, but for the sake of his dynasty and the restoration of his son and the possibility of coming to a negotiated settlement with the Austrians in which Mary Louise and, say, for example, a French marshal, let's take a Marshal Soult, say, for example, who would later become a politician in the uh, Orleanist regime in the 1830s, that could have formed a compromise given the unpopularity of Louis XVIII and potentially a more stable and enduring regime given the coalition fears of a Napoleonic return. But I don't really want to pander on that because, like I said, that's a counterfactual, that's alternative history, but nevertheless, it's interesting to consider. But after all of this and the effects of the loyalty of France and the loyalty of particular figures such as Murat and Ney, Napoleon is still opining on the betrayal, in this case, the betrayal of his enemy, Britain. Napoleon's ultimate reflection here is that death is nothing, but to live defeated is to die every day. Had Napoleon taken responsibility, and again, I'm almost positioning this as a Christian. Had Napoleon taken personal responsibility for his losses and thereby accepted a form of atonement for all he had done and ultimately the ruin he had wrought on France after 1813, after his rejection of the Frankfurt proposals, where I suggest it's the most interesting aspect in Napoleon's career, which is almost completely overlooked. The fact that he is saying death is nothing but to live defeated is to die every day shows that Napoleon will never get over the fact he lost. He will never forgive those who he believed betrayed him. He will never forgive the powers for interning him. And instead, he accepts his fate as a form of martyrdom, and not a martyrdom in the sense that he has become genuinely Christ-like. In the sense, he is an antichrist. He has taken a false crown of thorns and presents himself as the heroic sacrifice, the saviour of France. But as I said, this is the saviour of France, who rather than acting as the redeemer, as the deliverer, he has acted as the herald of the apocalypse of France, and not in the literal biblical sense, but in terms of resulting in the end of the world, the end of France's position as the premier power, the end of the French Empire, the end of an expanded France that would have made the rest of Europe tremble throughout the rest of the 19th century. So the contrast here is between the perception of the self-perception of Napoleon as the saviour of France and the reality is that Napoleon was the enemy of France. And this is why I think all implications of venerating Napoleon uncritically are ultimately anti-French. And, and it's worse than venerating Winston Churchill as saving the British Empire. You know, both Napoleon and Winston Churchill doomed their respective empires, but Napoleon has far more personal responsibility than Churchill. So that is the ultimate implication of this film I want to create. 
that Napoleon robbed France of her empire, but he did bequeath upon her a myth. And in this sense, Napoleon was successful because the Napoleonic myth is the purest indication that vain glory was Napoleon's supreme motivation, his enduring legacy, and therefore his greatest success. All right. I think that's enough in my attempt to rewrite a Napoleonic biopic, but hopefully out of those four ideas, and particularly the last one, which would be my own take on the subject, um, I hope I've given you quite a lot to think about. And again, I, I, I have to emphasize that this is what I thought about today. You know, I haven't been thinking about this for a very long time. It, it's just simply my own knowledge of history and reflecting back on the clusterfuck of this film and i always look at this and think about the opportunities lost as with napoleon funnily enough after frankfurt and i do believe that making of historical films historical epics is actually a service to history because like i say if we look at history as a process of historical reenactment, then all of these elements allow us an invitation into the past. It's a form of time travel, effectively. But it is impossible when the creators of this reenactment are so contemptuous of the source material and are so driven by personal animosity and vindictiveness that this is the fruit of their creativity or lack thereof. I do believe there are very interesting things you can bring about Napoleon. You have to demonstrate that Napoleon was great. He was formidable. He was charismatic, yet he was also terrible. And I mean terrible in the way that Ivan the Terrible is referred to, formidable, but ultimately a pox upon France. There is so much nuance and interest you can accrue regarding a a more sort of psychological and intellectual thematic examination of Napoleon. But I do not believe that anything created in the system at the moment is capable of producing this sort of nuance. So that would be the fundamental premise of my Napoleonic biopic. And all of the, you know, costumes, the casting, all of the music, of course, would have to be an essential to that. But that's obviously beyond my remit. I'm not a director and I don't have any budget if I wanted to do this sort of thing. But nevertheless, I can opine on a script. And that is where I'm going to leave it. But I'm going to answer your super chats. And uh, if I see any interesting questions in the last few minutes, I'll uh, answer those to the best of my ability. But um, hopefully I've given people a lot to talk about, so uh, I'll, I'll try and answer as many questions as I can. Um, Bolero393. Uh, Charlemagne had a tweet that the film served its purpose by destroying the image of a great white man. But even propaganda needs to be well made, use this film. That's the thing, though. I, I don't look at it as racial. I look at it as feminist. I mean, I, I don't think Ridley Scott is progressive in that way. I think, I mean, do you know what I find the ultimate irony of this? If you go back to Kingdom of Heaven again, Ridley Scott is basically, oh, my, the, the uh, victimized Muslims and the just cause of Salah al-Din. And yet he doesn't really talk about Napoleon's war in Egypt or Syria at all. So if anything, Ridley Scott, if he wanted to emphasize that, you know, white man bad, he really could have given it his all when he talked about Egypt. But again, I'm not sure whether to attribute that to incompetence or something else. I really don't know. But like I said, I think as the film currently exists, I think it's just more typically feminist. Um, Napoleon being conquered by Josephine and that really is it. I mean, like I said, Phoenix is not Napoleon. 
there is never any indication in this film that I get that he's playing Napoleon. He is simply playing um, the Joker or Commodus, albeit older and more depressed and jaded. There is nothing about this figure which lends itself to greatness. All right. Uh, Pup993 for £10. Uh, wish I saw your warning before watching it. Film was a haze of uninspired battles, lazy dialogue, and sex scandals being put unceremoniously front and centre to create the illusion of personal drama. I don't think it even was an illusion of personal drama. I think it was just a character assassination. I don't think they cared about the drama. I mean, you know, Game of Thrones has gratuitous sex scenes and it's able to create a far more compelling narrative despite all the nihilistic implications of that. I think it is possible to create a gratuitous and slightly farcical film without it being completely stupid. But the thing that this film ultimately suffers from is it's in every respect, it is uninspired and idiotic. And like I said, I was, I was flabbergasted by the battles and the incompetence of the battle scenes. I, I really was. I, I almost just fell asleep watching them because I know in my head how Austerlitz plays out and what the implications are, but I, I don't know. I, as far as I was concerned when I was watching the quote-unquote Austerlitz in this film, I was basically watching an excursion between Austrian, Russian, and French forces in the snow. There was nothing grand about it at all, nothing to indicate that tens of thousands of troops were being committed to this battle. For all its budget, Lord of the Rings, made 20 years ago, had far better battles where people were far more invested in them. And I'm, I know that's not an objective statement, but I do believe if you compare it subjectively, it's true. And go back to 1970 in Waterloo. You know, that's battle is truly epic in the traditional sense of being a historical epic. The fact that you can make battle scenes 50 years ago, you know, we're looking at Bondachuk here, um, and this is all you can do today, it's just pitiable. I mean, I'm not even sure what they were trying to get across with Rupert Everett's portrayal of Wellington, because like I said, all the characters are ridiculous and cartoonish. Um, I don't really know what his role was in this film. I mean, there was no indication of his strategy. There was no indication of Napoleon's strategy. It was just, you know, I'm, I'm going to put down this Corsican upstart and we Europeans can all sleep easy. And that was it. That really, I, I, I don't even want to talk about it. It's so stupid. All right. Uh, Alice Little, 1872. Thank you for £10. Uh, I like Alexander and Troy as a child, among many other historical films, particularly older films like Jason and the Argonauts, which helped interest me in history, Percy speaking. I mean, both of those films, I mean, it's good if it helps inspire you to history, but uh, I mean, I have problems with both of those films. In fairness to Alexander, Alexander really tries with the battles. I, I won't sort of take that away from it, but... I mean, it's it's kind of like the worst version of an Italian opera iteration of Alexander. I mean, I can just imagine, uh, what's his name, Colin Farrell, you know, going on an epic sort of 30-minute uh, uh, aria regarding, you know, uh, you know uh, the betrayal of his men and uh, all that sort of thing and the death of um, Hephaestion and all this sort of thing. I mean, it really is ridiculous. And Troy... Troy is nihilistic again in the sense that it is a historical reimagining of the mythology. And as a result, it becomes incre it's an incredibly materialistic portrayal. And all I can say is the acting is slightly better in Troy than Alexander, but that in itself is not a, um, a great film but like i said if it inspires you to do bigger and better things then you know all power to you and thank you for the super chat um bolero 393 the screenplay is the awful power fantasy every powerful man is insecure and desperate to dote on promiscuous mid <laughs> and take out his rage on the world um yeah that's that really is it <laughs> 
I know it's incredible and it's stupid to say it aloud, but uh, that is the film Bolero 393. Uh, Alice Little, 1872, uh, loved Alien and Blade Runner. Uh, Ridley Scott has fallen so low. I mean, even looking at Blade Runner, this is a point I actually needed to stress because it's something I forgot in my video regarding Ridley Scott's disdain for history. Uh, Ridley Scott is infamous for having about 10 different um, uh, cuts of Blade Runner. And he is also infamous for implying that Decker uh, was a replicant when that would really sort of screw up the whole sort of thematic arc of the film. But bear with me, I haven't seen Blade Runner in years. But um, yeah, from that, when he's sort of commenting on that, Ridley Scott is narcissistic and foul-mouthed in interviews when he's trying to def defend his decisions in Blade Runner. And what was Ridley Scott's counter to historical criticism of Napoleon, which I hope you can see is completely and utterly valid, because not only does it compromise the verisimilitude, the spirit of truth conveyed in this film, but it makes the film incomprehensible. His response was, well, historians talk about things after the fact, and then they write about them. You weren't there, so F off. So I wasn't joking, and I didn't even know about that quote when making that film. I mean, it should be self-evident that not only does Ridley Scott have a disdain for his historical subjects and his uh, settings, but he hates the discipline of history itself. AJSJ for $5, thank you very much. Uh, support Apostolic Majesty. Uh, always like, comment, and subscribe, and join the conversation after on the fan club Discord. All right, there's a, uh, there's a link there. I'm not sure if you can copy that, but um, it probably is better, AJSJ, to put that link in a comment under this video, but thank you. Um, Machiavelli Susco says for five dollars, very interesting. Well, thank you very much. And Darth Kilhoon for five dollars. Napoleon rolling over in his grave over Ridley Scott, making him seeing for a generation as a simp. I don't think he will make him be seen as for a generation as a simp. I don't think this film will have any greater impact at all. Um, in fact, the only I, I'm not necessarily convinced about that. I mean. One of the reasons I actually felt compelled to put out my video, I mean, I recorded a rant and then do I put this out? Do I put that out? Not, but then I, I looked at this sort of aggregate reviews and saw that people were reviewing it positively. And I didn't want people to go ahead and actually watch this film and suffer through what I had to. So maybe, maybe someone will actually enjoy the film. I don't see how anyone can enjoy the film because it's so hateful. I mean, even if you look at something like Braveheart, you know, for all its ridiculousness, Mel Gibson in that film is inspiring and charismatic. Uh, Gladiator is inspiring and Russell Crowe is charismatic. There is nothing in this film other than just a hatred of the powerful male figure in history, the deconstruction of the great man. So I, I hope it is forgotten for that because it's so obvious. I mean, Ridley Scott is all the subtlety of a sledgehammer in this film. Uh, all right. Um, that's the end of the super chat. So I'll, I'll try and skip through to see if there are any questions. I mean, if you at me, uh, it would be easier. So starting from Bolero 393, um, Apostolic Majesty, did you notice that there were several scenes without Napoleon in them? Uh, given the title was France, 1789-1815, um, I thought it was stupid. What do you mean, Bolero 393? Uh, which scenes uh, without Napoleon in them? Um, again, I'm working off memory, so I might be I might be wrong. But um, and uh, Alice Little, yes, I can understand if you were young. But like I said, if you take inspiration from these films, that's an ultimate blessing, even though um, I may disagree with the uh, the critical choice at the time. I didn't want to appear too harsh. All right. Uh, yes, I mean, you 
probably preempted my point wasn't Mel Gibson also brave and inspiring in the Patriot 393 at Blair 393 uh yes he was that film was still terrible uh, I mean the the only reason I I mean basically I was angry and I did that rant and then I went ahead and thought well no history as I keep mentioning is a creative exercise and historical fiction is in many ways coming up to the importance of academic uh, academic interest due to reasons that should be obvious I, I do put historical fiction on a pedestal because there are so many sort of literary allusions and parallels between real history in terms of narrative construction, thematic construction, and also in terms of verisimilitude and fidelity to research. All of these things are common among historical fiction, good historical fiction and historical nonfiction. I mean, if you're talking about simply archiving um, various uh, historical sources, um, I don't believe that is the work of a historian. I believe that is the work of a um, uh, an antiquarian. Uh, the historian provides exegesis. He provides the um, he creates the hermeneutic of interpretation in order to construe all the disparate facts of history, however you define them, and create something which is comprehensible. Right. Uh, Pierce Brosnan, Apostolic Majesty, are you a jacked bodybuilder? Yes. Apostolic Majesty, his brother in the directory, Bellero 393, and the meeting between Nicholas I and Josephine, um, Alexander I. Um, <sighs> I mean, his brother was the president of the Council of the 500. And then Napoleon does come in and try and start the coup. And then he bungles it. Then he runs out. That's historically true. But of course, the uh, the actual sort of directorial depiction of it and Phoenix's performance made it into like a it, it was basically slapstick comedy. And the meeting between. Alexander the first and Josephine was after the Treaty of Fontainebleau when Napoleon was forced into exile in Elba and it did cause quite a scandal and Josephine's sort of last act before dying was to actually be walking in the gardens of Malmaison with Alexander the first so no uh, those events did in fact take place without Napoleon <sighs> Uh, Bison American Club, Apostolic Majesty, why did the French support uh, Napoleon a second time? Uh, there are many reasons for it. The unpopularity of Leo XVIII, the fact that the Congress of Vienna had shewn so many territories away from France, France had expanded to its natural borders in 1802, and as a result of the Congress of Vienna, France had been returned to its 1792 borders. In other words, the borders France had at the beginning of the Revolutionary Wars, which, in fairness, was actually very fair. In fairness, was very fair to be to give the Congress its due. These were exceptionally favourable terms, given the fact that France went on to wreak havoc on Europe for over 20 years. The fact that France could return with its pre-war territories intact is nothing short of a miracle and is actually in the spirit of reconciliation with France and the other powers and the strategic necessity thereof. But of course, the French people couldn't interpret such a dramatic loss in such a short amount of time, which was only one year. Louis XVIII had been forced to issue the July Declaration, the Charter of July, uh, to shore up his position. But ultimately, he was not really well loved by the royalists. They tended to gravitate around the figure of the Comte d'Artois. And what else? Um, another important factor to consider is that after 1814, all the French prisoners of war came back. So Napoleon had an army assembled for him in absentia 
which didn't really experience the trials and tribulations of 1814. And it is the army that defected to Napoleon, not the entirety of France. Paris defected to Napoleon, but Normandy, the Vendée and Aquitaine remained restive. And indeed, an interesting angle regarding Napoleon is that I've consistently gone back against this idea that to be anti-Napoleon is to be anti-French because Napoleon was never accepted universally across France. Napoleon's main sort of centers of power were in the Rhineland, both French Rhineland and German Rhineland, northern and eastern France and northern Italy. Areas such as Brittany, the Vendée, the everywhere basically south of the Loire Valley had a very checkered relationship with Napoleon and they were far more likely to go over to the monarchists, which is why the royalist insurgency was able to last for so long and why Napoleon resorted to those horrific tactics on uh, Pré Vendémarie um, uh, to put the revolution down. And if you look at the military deployments in the Hundred Days campaign, tens of thousands of French troops were sent to put down a royalist uprising in Normandy. Uh, uh, Apostolic Majesty from Duke Valentino. Were Fouché and Talleyrand in the film? Uh, what are your thoughts on them? They were in the film, but they were cameos. Uh, Fouché was a cameo, and Talleyrand was simplistic deprived of all nuance and he was basically an exposition dump for lack of a better word um talleyrand was there basically saying napoleon you should take power napoleon you should become king not emperor king um napoleon you should marry mary louise i've talked about Napo uh, talleyrand a lot um, he is in a stream I've done regarding the grand strategy of the Napoleonic Empire. Talleyrand is a fascinating figure in his own right, not just in terms of his diplomacy, his uh, moral uh, maneuverability, uh, his role in the creation of the Assignat, his original revolutionary fervor, and then his desire to, or rather his willingness to betray regime after regime, which is why I think Talleyrand would be a perfect figure to put front and center with my Coup Brumaire dark comedy film. Uh, as for Fouché, he was minister of police during the early consulate, and then he returned as uh, minister of police later on. And he was guilty of some of the worst excesses of um, the Jacobin reign of terror. Uh, which is why, if anything, he was so desperate to support Napoleon with the fear of the royalists coming back and uh, executing him in the way they did with Ney in 1815. Uh, Bellero 393, uh, Apostolic Majesty, they didn't need to show Alex I and Josephine. Uh, the film also shows Napoleon received the news of Josephine's infidelity. No, it, it did need to show Alex I and Josephine because I think the film actually did try to imply that Alexander I and Josephine were having it off. I, I don't give Ridley Scott any credit here. I think it's just that stupid. Um, you know, she was cucking him and he was jealous and he was simp. I, I'm, not, I'm not going to give him the benefit of the doubt at this point. Right. Uh, interesting. Steve Vanren, Apostolic Majesty, was Napoleon anti-Catholic? Oh, that's a very interesting question, which I've attempted to answer. On the one hand, Napoleon pushed back against the worst excesses of Jacobin anti-Catholicism. He repealed the 10-day week. He repealed the French revolutionary calendar he reinstituted Sundays and the veneration of saints' days. He negotiated a concordat with the Catholic Church, and he felt it necessary to receive a papal blessing for his coronation. The Napoleonic concordat, by the way, was the 
basis of French relations with the Vatican for the entirety of the 19th century until 1905. So he had a very lasting impact in terms of France and its relationship with the broader Catholic Church. However, Napoleon was also responsible for the institution and proliferation of the uh, Code Civil or the Code Napoleon, uh, which I believe in its essence was thoroughly anti-Catholic and universalist and stemming from the ideas of the revolution and was essentially the product of uh, one of the great sort of workhorses of the revolution who was Cambacias. And you can either say that Napoleon was the ultimate imperialist vis-a-vis -vis papal supremacy because the Roman Republic at once deposed the Pope I, I think it was Pius VI. Don't don't quote me on that. I may be wrong. It's one of the Piuses. I'm, I'm very sorry not to have the, the numbers on hand and memory. And then the Pope, after the restoration of the Papal States, after the Roman Republic, was actually locked up by Napoleon. So Napoleon used the Catholic Church as an instrument for his government. He did not broke brook any disagreements and as we saw with how he treated his own family how he treated his marshals and how he was incessant on the idea of betrayal everywhere it is only consistent therefore that he locked up the pope for fear that the pope would in turn betray him but what does it mean the pope betraying napoleon anyway uh, apostolic majesty from alice little do you think feminism colors all the Ridley Scott films, I think in Alien in particular, uh, especially given this film, The Kingdom of Heaven, with Ripley. Um, uh, with Ripley, possibly, the you know, old classic feminism before the whole girl boss thing became incredibly sort of cliche. Uh, as for Sybil, Sibylla in um, Kingdom of Heaven, uh, if there was a feminist motif behind that, it was delivered incompetently because Sibylla was an incredibly passive character in the film, where she was far more active politically in real life. And again, maybe it's an issue with incompetence, like with this film. Like I said, um, like I said, Josephine was far more interesting and politically savvy than the impression that has been implied in this film, which is almost purely sexual. Uh... Apostolic Majesty by Oliver Floyd. I'm, I'm going to answer just a few more questions because I'm, I'm losing my voice, but thank you anyway for the strew of uh, questions. I think it's important to hash all of this out. Why was the Treaty of Vienna fairer than the Treaty of Versailles, considering the fact that Napoleon wrecked havoc on Europe for 20 years? Because, and I'm going to put this bluntly, we didn't have the era of mass democracy and total warfare. We almost did in Napoleon, but not quite. There was a genuine interest in holding Europe firm to the order which, which predominated before 1792. And therefore it was the interests of the coalition powers to restore France to its pre-war position as that of being a Catholic monarchy and a potential bulwark against the encroachments of the revolution. In that sense, France had to be rehabilitated and had to be integrated into this new political system. Whereas the opposite happened with Germany and Weimar, despite the abdication of the Kaiser and the attempts of the German social democrats to present the world with a new tolerable democratic regime, which would appeal to the likes of the conquerors, the French decided to adopt punitive measures anyway. In other words, in other ways, you can say that the whole democratic project, the idea of self-determination, was contrary to the ideas of good old-fashioned, democratically inspired revanche. In other words, we talk about ideological um, discontinuity, incompetence, and all of the horrors that are going to, did beset Europe after that point. Right. I'm going to try and answer questions which are pertinent to the film now, as interesting as these general questions on uh, history are. And if they're not, I'll probably call it a day there. All right, I think I'll call it a day here.
Uh, this has been slight, something slightly different, obviously, for this channel, but I thank everyone for bearing with me. Obviously, this isn't strict history, but like I said, it's a worthwhile and I believe a rather fruitful endeavor to go along this. And to contrast the view that I'm simply interested in demolishing um, historical biopics, I actually want to present a thoroughgoing analysis and indeed offer a juxtaposition to what could have been what a creative and nuanced portrayal of Napoleon can actually offer as opposed to the disaster which we were presented with. Right. Uh, Duke Valentino, Apostolic Majesty, was the cinematography good? Uh, Ridley Scott makes, as you can probably see actually in this image, which I've used as the thumbnail, it's actually intentional, this thumbnail, because um, it's drab. And I thought it actually went well with my uh, my usual sort of uh, white or uh, light sort of white gold color scheming because it was sort of uh, drab and Napoleon has a sort of uh, lost in the headlight sort of picture here. But um, uh, no, I think his cinematography is drab. It's cold. It's um, it did a serious disservice to the battles. I mean, Waterloo um, is miserable to look at. So no, I think the cinematography is terrible and that's a consistent uh, artistic decision of Ridley Scott. All right, please like and comment on the stream. Thank you very much. It helps the algorithm. Uh, subscribe. And if you really enjoy my content and want to see me producing more, uh, become a channel member. But on that note, I will be putting out one more video this year, which will be part three on my series on the agony of, Medi of Middle Eastern Christendom, which is something that I should be focusing on more than this because it seems superfluous by comparison, or not superfluous. Um, I, I hate to say silly because a lot of people are invested in this, but um, it doesn't have quite the same gravitas for me in terms of being able to focus on that, especially with what's been going on in the Middle East. But I will put that out. And this will be my last stream, not my last video, my last stream of this year. And hopefully I will see you all again in 2024. So happy Christmas and happy new year. Good night, everyone.